we have been covering a three-part series and today we will complete that three-part series and the series is called Christ Lives. If you recall a couple of weeks back we looked at the Valley of Dry Bones according to the prophet called Ezekiel and we looked at the fact that uh, it is important for us to to remain planted in the resurrection because the resurrection is planted in us that we look and we live in a world that is looks like and feels like oftentimes we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death that we are walking in a valley that is filled with dry bones sometimes not knowing or understanding what's going on or where things are headed or what's going to happen next but Christ lives. Last week, we looked at the fact that Christ knows or Christ lives because Christ knows. Christ knows before we know, Christ sees before we see and through revelatory power is able to show us and illustrate to us and reveal to us the things of God. And so today in this third part, of this Christ Lives series, this final part of this Christ Lives th uh, series, we wanna look at this title, Shafts of Light, Shafts of Light. Today is Mother's Day. And normally if we were meeting on campus, if we were meeting four Sundays out of the month on Mother's Day, we would put on our Sunday's best. We'd have our hats on and our shoes are shining and wearing our nice suits and ties to celebrate this wonderful day called Mother's Day. After church, we would certainly celebrate our mothers by going to a restaurant, which we may even do today. To celebrate our mothers, uh, going to a nice restaurant, sitting with the family and eating a hearty meal and sharing thoughts and ideas and laughing and talking with one another because today is Mother's Day, a day that we celebrate our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers and mother figures and godmothers and foster mothers, that we celebrate these great women, that brothers, if it wasn't for our sisters, we could not be here. We celebrate Mother's Day and some will celebrate as we just mentioned in restaurants. Some will celebrate in uh, around the dinner table in the home of a friend or loved one to celebrate this wonderful Mother's Day. Some will sit around the table or go to a friend's house or go to that restaurant and will take pictures and we'll laugh together and we'll smile together. Some will visit their mothers in hospitals. Some celebrations on this Mother's Day will happen in nursing homes, will happen in rehab facilities because that's where mom is. On this Mother's Day, some, some of us, uh, maybe you or maybe someone you know, will celebrate their mom by talking to them because of a collect phone call that has come or because they're sitting across from them talking on the phone because that's the only way they can hear from them because there's a, a foot of glass thick that their mother is in prison. This is the only way in which they can celebrate their mother on this Mother's Day, there are some who will celebrate the fact that their mother is physically here, but mentally gone. There are others that will celebrate Mother's Day from the perspective of the fact that someone, this mother, this grandmother, this woman, took them into their household that they are not biologically related, but this son or daughter is grateful for this foster mother who has given them a loving home. 
as giving them a home that can encourage them, a home that lets them know that they can be anything that they wanna be in the world, even the president of the United States of America. There are still others who won't be able to celebrate Mother's Day in the same way as, as those who have their mothers physically there or those mother figures physically there in front of them because their mothers have gone on to glory. In fact, this week, a family will bury their mother. There are still some who are mothers whose child is no longer here. And in celebrating this Mother's Day, it won't feel the same. It, it won't be the same. There will be a sense of awkwardness or strangeness because they were looking forward to being able to celebrate this day with their child and with their children. Still, there are some mothers who have been unable to have children, who, whose womb has been diagnosed or considered as barren, who would love to be a mother, to have their own biological children, but who are unable for whatever reason to, to do so. And so Mother's Day for them won't be quite the same as it will for those of us whose mothers are sitting in front of us, whose mothers are still here on this side of the River Jordan. And still there are some who will celebrate their mothers through FaceTime because mom has been deployed to some foreign country belonging to some branch of the military fighting on behalf of this country. And speaking of that, there are some who have been separated, children who have been separated from their mothers because they belong to a war infested place. And it got me to thinking about a question. What makes Mother's Day so happy? What makes Mother's Day so happy? I imagine that when we look in the Masoretic text of the Old Testament, and we come across those like Rebecca, Isaac's wife, and, and those like Hannah in 1 Samuel, whose womb was barren, who desired to have their own children, but whose womb was barren. Maybe in the 21st century, someone who may fit that particular MO is asking the same question, what makes Mother's Day so happy? I imagine that Rebecca being one who is married uh, to the bloodline of Christ or in her husband, Isaac, who is along the bloodline of Christ, who simply wanted to have that child or Hannah, who, who is married to Elkanah, who had two wives, Hannah and his other wife, who, who his other wife was able to have a, a, a just a, a bunch of children, even rubbed it in the face of Hannah each year. But Hannah, she went to God and she went to God with a heart of and authenticity, with, with a heart of, of righteousness, with a heart of humility, asking God, if you just give me a child, I will dedicate this child to you. And the Bible says that one night, Hannah laid with her husband, Elkanah, God remembered her prayers and God gave her a son by the name of Samuel. And Hannah did exactly as she had told God that she would do, that she dedicated the life to Samuel's life to God, that, that, that all that, that Samuel would do and, and all that would be placed and poured in him would be for the glory of God. Can you imagine Hannah? who only got to see her son once a year during the, the, the feast of the Passover, going up to Jerusalem, uh, to the great temple where the high priest Eli was at the time and, and was the mentor of Samuel and pouring into his life and helping him to grow. But here is a mother that only got to see her son once a year, following through with the promise that she made to God because of what God and how God had blessed her life. I wonder if in the 21st century if Hannah would ask the question, what's so good or what's so happy about Mother's Day? But still, 
God heard her prayer and God blessed her life and gave her a son. Would later become a prophet of Israel, helping to lead and guide, helping to, to be that, 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 that connection, that annex, if you will, between God and God's people to do the wonderful and the great things that God will call him to do. This mother prayed. She simply had a desire simply wanted to be a mother and God blessed her heart. God heard her prayers. God answered her prayers and gave her a son. She gave God love. She gave God praise. She gave God glory because God had answered her prayers. But then I think about, I think about Sarah in the Old Testament, Abraham's wife. I think about Elizabeth in the New Testament. Zechariah's wife. And Sarah and Elizabeth were both very old or up in age and did not think that they were able to bear children, that their bodies were unable to handle what it would go, what it would need to go through to carry through a president, a pre, a, a pregnancy through uh, a full term. They were concerned that how can this be? How can this be, be made manifest? How can this actually happen? I, I, I'm 81 years old, Sarah would say, and, and Elizabeth would say, I, I'm old myself, and I don't see how God can make such a thing happen. But God in God's providence, God in God's revelatory power gives both Sarah in the Old Testament and Elizabeth in the New Testament a son. Sarah's son would be named Isaac. Elizabeth's son would be named John the Baptist. Isaac being one who is along the bloodlines uh, of Christ, the promise that God had made to Abraham would then be transferred to Isaac and then transferred to Jacob all the way until we get to a time when John the Baptist would come in the, as the forerunner to, to tell the world about the light that is coming, that I baptize you with water, but this one will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so I, I, I this is what I was thinking about on this on this Mother's Day, what, what Sarah, what Elizabeth, what Rebecca, what Hannah might say in this 21st century about the things that God has done for them, that, that living in a world and living in a world of uncertainty, living in a world where you have more questions than you have answers, can God still live? Can Christ still live in our lives? Christ lives because Christ comes to restore restore as he did the womb of Rebecca and Hannah. Christ lives to bring this revelatory power as he did in the life of Sarah and in the life of Elizabeth, even in their elder age. But then I thought about another. I thought about the wife of Job, who doesn't get a lot of conversation, doesn't get a lot of preaching if you will. The Bible doesn't really talk a whole lot about Job's wife. In fact, when we look at the wife of Job, oftentimes she gets a bad rap because she, she, she encourages Job to curse God and die. That's another sermon for another day. But, but, but the reality is that just like Job, his wife, they lost everything. They lost their livelihood. They lost their children. And here it is, the wife of Job, some believe it was use it and others believe it was Dinah, but, but whoever, whenever, however, they lost something. They lost, if nothing more, they lost their children. They lost something great. And having to go through that particular process, walk that part of the journey to, 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 to know that everything that you have put your, your, your blood, sweat and tears in raising your children and now they are no longer here. Well, in that situation, we discover that God brings redemption to their lives, that God is a God that redeems God's own. They could have cursed God. They could have been angry. They could have been shunned God, said, we don't want to have nothing to do. But instead, what they did, even in the midst of adversity, even in the midst of friends who were pointing the finger, they still trusted God. 
And if you know the story, that you know they got back everything that they lost and then some. That God is in the restoration business, that God is in the revelation business, and God is in the redemption business. But then I thought of another, thought of Mother Mary, the, the mother of Jesus the Christ. This young woman who became pregnant with the immaculate conception that God by his Holy Spirit would impregnate her to give to her a son, our savior. That while she was able to enjoy watching the miracles that he would do, turning water into wine and, and, and allowing the blind to see and allowing the lame to walk, that she also would have to sit there and watch her son die on a cross. Sit there and watch those who were opposition to God's uh, plan, opposition uh, to God's rule, watch them to drive nails in his hands and nails in his feet. She'd have to sit at the foot of the cross and watch her son bleed and watch her son die. But I thank God that, that God made sure that there was an adoption in place. When Jesus from that old rugged cross would say, mother behold thy son, and son behold thy mother. What makes Mother's Day so happy? I wanna finish with this story. I wanna thank you for praying for my mother and my father. And Without going into great detail, many of you are aware that there are some medical conditions, some medical issues that we are facing as a family right now as it relates to my mom. And my mother and I have always been really close, both close to me and to my brother for different reasons, but we've always been close. We've always been able to talk about anything, pretty much. She's always been there. She's always poured into my brother and I's life. She's always encouraged us. She's been tough on us. But as I say, tough love is love too. She's always been there to, 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 to teach principles of life, to teach us the lessons of life. She's one who laughs a lot. I call her a firecracker because she's full of energy. She's always been one that people respected. She was a, a woman who was a, a math professor for 10 years at Long Island University Brooklyn College with only a bachelor's degree. She later became one of the associate deans of the School of Pharmacy. Eventually she would fall back from the workforce for a little while. And then when going back into the workforce, she, with her two master's degrees, master's in psychology and master, master's in child psychology and a master's in education, she began to work with elementary school children in particularly with special needs. She's a two-time teacher of the year first in the county or in Orange County in the city of Orlando and second in the state of Florida. She's done magnificent work. Teachers love her, children love her. In fact, in the state of Florida, her children that she was teaching with these special needs, emotional needs and other kinds of needs would often score the same or higher scores than, than children in regular education uh, classrooms that were in the same grade level. She was the reason why the school, she was one reason why the schools in which she worked would get high grades according to the state based on the way uh, the state exam is administered in the grades that they give the schools. She retired a few years ago. And I don't know 
how it all unfolds, how it all happens. But at some point, her memory just didn't work the same way that it used to. And there'd be times when the mom that gave birth to us, the mom that we knew, the mom that, that, that raised us, the mom that taught us the lessons, the mom that we laughed with, it just seemed like she started to disappear. And we have a, as a family have had to learn how to navigate this part of the journey, learn how to deal with what it is we are looking at when the very person, they are not physically gone, but mentally they are not what you used to know, what we used to know. And I'm not telling you this story so that you can feel sorry for us. We certainly can use your prayers, absolutely. But I'm not telling you this story for, for the purpose of sympathy. I'm telling you this story because there are also moments where we are able to experience the mom we've always known. Where we laugh together, we share memories and, and we have a lot of fun doing that, talking with one another. All of that to just say that, that, that what makes Mother's Day so, so good, what makes Mother's Day so happy is that even in the midst of the struggle, even in the midst of the challenges, even in the midst of uh, sometimes the darkness, there are shafts of light. There are shafts of light of Christ that, that, that reminds us that Christ lives, that God is still on the throne, that God is still in control. And that's all I came by to tell you today. When you're sitting in the restaurant and you're sharing that moment together, remember that Christ lives and, and that God has given you a moment in that time where shafts of light, the shafts of Christ are, are able to be seen, able to be heard, able to be witnessed and able to be experienced. When you're sitting around the dinner table and you have that empty chair with that, uh, that, that drapery around it to honor mom who is no longer here, share the memories and share the lessons and share the jokes and, and laugh and smile with one another because that's a moment when the shafts of light are able to be seen, where, where Christ's presence is able to be felt to remind us that God is still in control when you're taking pictures and when you're laughing with one another. Let that be a time. Let you be reminded that Christ still lives in your life, even if you're in the hospitals and celebrating Mother's Day there, even if you're in the nursing home or the rehab facility celebrating Mother's Day there, remember that what makes Mother's Day so happy and what makes Mother's Day so good is the fact that Christ is in it. And, 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 and we can, and Christ lives when we are able to see that Christ is in the very situations that we are. No, it may not feel good all the time. No, it may not taste good or or look good or feel good all the time, but still Christ lives. Christ lives to restore. Christ lives to reveal. Christ lives to redeem. And Christ lives because of the resurrection. Even if you're sitting in that prison, talking to your loved one uh, uh, through a foot of glass. And, and the only way you can hear their voice is when you put that, uh, that phone uh, piece up to your ear. Remember that this is a moment where Christ can show you that I am still uh, at work and I'm still doing things. Even if you can't see what I'm doing, even if you struggle to see what I'm doing, I am still working a work. Even when you are dealing foster moms, thank you so much for taking in that young person that needed a loving home, that needed a home of encouragement. And in those moments when you're sitting with that child, even if they will not always be in your household because they age out of the system or they end up having to go to another home because that's just the way the system is operating, make sure you take that moment that you and your son and you and your daughter are sitting there together to realize that this is a Christ moment where two or three 
three are gathered in my name, I will be there in the mix, God says. Uh, even if it's our mothers that have gone to glory, take a moment to remember the things that they shared with you, to take a moment to remember the times when you were being, when they were raising you uh, in this world. Even uh, if it's mothers and your children are gone, take a moment to remember what it was like when you were still, they were sitting at the dinner table with you, when you talked to them on the phone, when they would send you a text message, whatever the situation may be, to the mothers who whose wombs may still be struggling to have children, uh, there you can be a mother figure so that when your time comes, that you will have the practice that you need to be able to be the mother that God has called you to be, even when it comes to the mothers who are deployed. Make sure you, hopefully, you can talk to whoever the superior is and say, I need to FaceTime my baby just to let them know I'm thinking about them. And so your baby can say to you, happy Mother's Day, mom, even though you're on the other side of the globe. To, to mothers who are separated from their children because of a war-torn uh, zone, uh, know that Christ still lives. Christ is still restoring. Christ is still revealing. Christ is still redeeming. And Christ is the resurrected. So you and I can operate in the power of the resurrected Christ. We thank God today for the shafts of light that God shows us. We thank God today uh, that God has given us a happy Mother's Day that you and I can choose to be a part of and to choose to share in. The reality is that Christ lives, everybody. Christ lives. And he gives us shafts of light. He gives us shafts of light so that we can be reminded that Christ is risen, that Christ is risen indeed.